was last year, eight times a year before, and it's almost every year I come over. And I come over because I do some investing, but mostly for Michigan, because it's very easy to get along with the people of China, because I feel a deep relationship with them. So my wife and I were discussing, you know, we want to do something very significant for the campaign. And we talked about it. And Ken is like a hero to me. Because I, you know, just one quick example. I was at a business meeting in Shanghai, and the vice mayor was speaking. And, I went, and he said something that made me think he knew Ken. So I went up to him and I said, uh, do you know my friend Kenneth Lieberthal? He said, not only do I know him, but I will tell you something. He said, there are many people who say they're China experts. Ken is a China expert. His effect on U.S.-China relationships, what he did in the administration, in the Clinton administration, the countless students that he has mentored and taught. We've met with several this, on this trip who've said they are now living in China because of taking his course. That his course was the best course that they took in seven years. So we decided we would fund the Center for Chinese Studies because I think that this should be the place for the world to go. And I wanted it named after him because of his effect. And I have to tell you how honored I am to have my name attached with Kenneth G. Lieberthal. So it's not the only amount of money we want to raise for this. We need your help. We need your help with introductions. We need some fundraising because we need the support for fellowships. We need it for, to support students, faculty, program. We want people, we want Chinese uh, faculty to come and study in Ann Arbor. We want our faculty to come over here. We want our students to learn what China is really about. And when I'm talking about China, I'm talking about greater China. Ken is one of the many people who helped to make University of Michigan education so important. I have been so impressed with how the university <coughs> has supported this initiative, how Allison A and the other inst institutions at Michigan, the other uh, units, have come together and we are going to make this the place in the world. If you're interested in helping, please contact Peggy Burns, Tina Sala, Tina Sala or Brody Redmington, or myself. It is my great pleasure at this point in time, we've already heard all the good things about Ken, Ken <laughs> but my great friend, Ken Lieberthal, because he is a great friend, and I'm honored to be associated with him. consequential bilateral relationship in the world today. Uh, the reasons for that are obvious. Uh, we have the two, the world's two largest economies and the largest domestic markets. We have the world's two largest militaries and the largest military budgets. We are clearly the two most consequential countries in Asia. And Asia is the most consequential region 
of the world based on really uh, two major elements. One was respect for the region's importance, and secondly, a determination to build a constructive relationship with China as, a, as integral to a regional strategy that would assure long-term stability and economic dynamism in the region, with America uh, continuing to be a major factor in the region. But almost from the start, there were many in China who suspected the real reason for the reinvigoration of policy toward Asia, for the increased focus on Asia, was in fact to seek to contain China uh, and even to disrupt China's rise. And this suspicion became even stronger as the global financial crisis kind of made in America uh, unfolded across the globe. The argument then that one heard increasingly frequently in China was that the U.S. seeing that its position had been badly hurt in the world uh, would be even more determined to prevent China from closing the gap uh, in capability uh, and global role with the United States. And so I think there's more reason to suspect an ongoing focus on greater involvement uh, in Asia. Second issue was the Sunny Land Summit. This was a new type of summit meeting between the presidents of our two countries uh, shortly after Xi Jinping became uh, General Secretary of China and President and so forth. Uh, this was an unprecedented uh, uh, event. Uh, the two presidents agreed to meet uh, over a period of eight hours, you know, overnight, but all together, face to face meeting for eight hours. They started off talking to each other as political leaders with the question of, uh, during my term in office, what do I want to accomplish? What, as a national leader, are my major goals, domestically and internationally? What are my major problems? And how can we, over this period of time, best address the issues that confront us? It's the kind of uh, exercise that no American leader had had with China well beyond talking points and prepared papers. It was eight hours, uh, and so it was a, an opportunity to really get to know each other. Grown to the point where there's a possibility that the U.S.-China relationship is approaching an inflection point, where the assumptions become more negative rather than positive uh, about the future. Uh, those in each country who have most distrusted the intentions of the other are increasingly finding the voice. And because the issues involved are the most emotional and most difficult kinds of issues to address in a dispassionate fashion, issues of sovereignty, of energy resources, which are vital to uh, geopolitics and to any country's future, of uh, existing security commitments and what they mean and how they should be tested, uh, these are the issues that have now moved to the center. And there's a real danger that some specific emotional issues will come to dominate the relationship. For example, uh, on May 17th, less than a week ago, or exactly a week ago, Reuters quoted a senior U.S. official, unnamed but senior U.S. officials, as saying that China's relations with its neighbors are, and I quote, raising some fundamental questions for us about China's long-term strategic intentions, end quote. It uh, goes on to summarize that this official then said that Beijing's recent pattern of advancing territorial claims through coercion and intimidation, quote, are straining the U.S.-China relationship because these actions raise questions about our ability to partner together in Asia or even bilaterally. On the same day, China's foreign ministry spokeswoman, Hua Chunyin, said at a regular briefing in Beijing, and I quote, a series of mistaken American statements have emboldened some countries, she was talking about Vietnam, Japan, and the Philippines, have emboldened some countries' dangerous and provocative actions. And she then urged Washington to be more responsible in its words and deeds. So what should we do? Uh, this is a tough time. First, I think we have to remember that the cost bilaterally, regionally, and globally of allowing ourselves to slip into a basically antagonistic relationship would be extremely high. Peace and security in Asia depend on the U.S. and China 
being able to to cooperate effectively and to have a sufficient trust in each other's uh, words and deeds. Economic growth potential relies on peace and security. We see, for example, in the Sino-Japanese uh, you know, deterioration of relations uh, over the uh, island dispute in the East China Sea. Uh, a few years ago, that sparked riots in China, and then there was a drawdown of investment from Japan into China. Political risk analysis went up. Uh, we see the same thing now with, with riots in Vietnam, which caused a lot of damage and so forth. So that uh, security fosters the environment where one can maximize welfare by optimizing uh, trade and investment uh, and benefiting uh, the quality of life. Uh, if we develop an increasingly antagonistic relationship, our ability to develop the mutual confidence that we need in order to uh, lead the world on climate change negotiations, uh, I think will be severely tested. And our capacity to work together to prevent nuclear proliferation and to constrain terrorists are among the other issues that are of consequence that will become very difficult uh, to get a hold of. So I think we need to take care to avoid having the strategic distrust impede areas of win-win cooperation. Our relationship is, in fact, uh, very dynamic. Uh, if you get away from the headlines and get away from these emotional issues of maritime uh, territorial disputes and so forth. U.S. and China are now negotiating a bilateral investment treaty. Uh, there is a huge amount of trade and investment, but that kind of treaty will increase tremendously uh, the opportunities of, uh, of major businesses in each side uh, to invest in the other side, to develop uh, ongoing interests and deep knowledge about the situation elsewhere and to generate jobs and prosperity. Uh, there are U.S.-China uh, consultations going on now to boost confidence in what can be done uh, in Paris in 2015 on climate change. Those discussions between us are uh, not in the public domain. Uh, I was involved in one last week and it's clear from that that both sides want to do a lot at this point. Both sides recognize the dangers. Both sides need the other side, need to have confidence in what the other side will do in order to be able politically to take the actions at home that they need to take in order to do their part. Uh, we're doing a lot in cooperation regarding North Korea's nuclear program. Uh, if the US and China and Japan, if the three of us cannot uh, manage our relationship constructively, you really have to be very concerned about what Kim Jong-un in North Korea will see as opportunities uh, to advance his own uh, rather pernicious interests. Uh, we have developed wide-ranging military exchanges, something that has lagged far behind in our relationship today. And under Xi Jinping, this has expanded very rapidly. Uh, and we are now engaged in military discussions about strategic postures in Asia and China has been invited to participate in the largest military exercise uh, in the world that uh, the U.S. organizes uh, called RIMPAC 2014 and has accepted doing that. So we need to uh, not lose sight of all of these things that are going on that really shape the future on the major issues of the future uh, and not let these uh, headline activities uh, or these activities that grab headlines become very emotional and have our spokespeople shooting uh, disparaging comments at each other uh, move to the fore. I think that uh, at the most fundamental level, uh, what, uh, what gives the most hope for that over time is that so many Americans now and so many Chinese have gotten to know each other as individuals have traveled, I, I was talking to uh, Rich Robel's brother uh, uh, during the reception right before we began, and uh, he was saying he had just made his first trip to China, traveling around with Rich and, and his friends, and uh, was so impressed by how many similarities there are between Americans and Chinese when they, when they meet each other, when they talk together. The, and the kinds of problems we have, the kinds of aspirations we have, the value on education, the 
concerns for our children, the concerns for the future. These are all critical issues. Uh, and uh, let me conclude, therefore, uh, obviously this talk is one with an uncertain ending to it, uh, but with a real hope. And to my mind, one of the most important dimensions of all of this is the number of students who study in each other's uh, systems, uh, who get to know their counterparts in the other country, who get to understand people as people and not as caricatures and images, uh, those that you don't know and don't trust, but now they're friends and people whose lives you understand. And uh, it brings me back to my mind to the importance of things like the University of Michigan Center for Chinese Studies uh, that seek to educate the students in not only political science or not only uh, engineering, or seek to educate students to understand the intersection of history, of culture, of political system, of uh, demographics, of environment, if you want to understand uh, what another country is all about why they do what they do, and how to get the best possible future out of a complicated relationship and world. So with that, uh, uh, there are obviously a lot of other dimensions to U.S.-China relations, uh, and there are a lot of details about the issues I've raised that I've just kind of skimmed over the surface to set a framework. I think we have about 10 minutes, is that correct? Uh, for Q&A, I'd be delighted to have a question from any of you if, one, you first give not only your name, but your class and your degree at the University of Michigan. If you didn't get a degree from the University of Michigan, speak more quietly. <laughs> <laughs> For which that kind of escalating uh, uh, spiral kind of sees, and then, you know, a way to bring that back into the, to the way, to the right direction, right? Because yeah. unless that, that kind of that breaking point happens, I don't really see uh, a channel or a venue for that to, 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 to seize. So can you give us a perspective on how that happens or what kind of dialogues or it changes? Well, I'll, I'll tell you, what has happened in the past, you know, leaders don't just pick up the phone and call each other's staffs, their top assistants, know each other very well, and, and they get to work on figuring out what can be done uh, so that you can get a more, you know, some sort of constructive steps taken. Uh, uh, I think that, uh, you know, in, in, there are a lot of areas where we could begin to move this forward. I also think that the top leaders need to get together and to discuss some of these, uh, how we handle some of these maritime uh, disputes. Uh, there's been some, uh, to my mind, unfortunately sloppy language on both sides, uh, where uh, words have been used that have not been heard the way they were intended to be heard. Uh, to give you one example from the U.S. side, uh, when Secretary Clinton was in Hanoi, uh, this was in 2010, and ex for the first time expressed a, a set of principles that the U.S. felt were very important for addressing uh, territorial disputes and maritime territorial disputes in the South China Sea. One of the things she called for was what she called a collaborative approach to negotiating these disputes. Well, collaborative was understood in China to mean multilateral. Right? So you have a dispute between China and Vietnam, and perhaps all of ASEAN should participate along with China. The Chinese took that as unwarranted and uh, totally inappropriate uh, because they believe the countries involved directly in the, the two countries that disagree on a particular issue should be the ones that negotiate it. Uh, that term was actually developed in the State Department through extensive discussions to mean bilateral but peaceful, right? But there was no explanation of that. And so having said collaborative, Secretary Clinton and her staff, et cetera, thought that they had communicated bilateral but without use of force. And uh, what in fact the Chinese understood her to say was, your approach of bilateral negotiations is illegitimate. Would there be a shooting, um, you know, incident or a war at some point well, in time? What, what would be the escalation which the U.S. would be dragged uh, into that, into those affairs? And calls on the United States to show that it is good to its word that it will meet its treaty obligations by having a presence there, by, by, by a show of force. Uh, you can have three possible outcomes and all of them are terrible. Right? One outcome 
one is that we say, you know, we have to maintain the, the integrity of our commitments, or else, you know, no one will act uh, on the basis of uh, uh, complete confidence in our commitments. Uh, and so we get involved. If we get involved, I think, frankly, uh, the Chinese military will not do well. The result of that will be that uh, the U.S.-Japan alliance is strengthened. We stood up, we saved Japan today. Uh, but that alliance has a clearly anti-China focus, which has not been the focus of it over the years in the past. Second is, we don't get involved. We think Japan was at fault. Or we think that this is just too, the, the risk of a huge escalation has just become a magnitude. So we back on, at which point, that means we lose confidence in the alliance would probably unravel. Uh, Japan would then not rely on the United States to protect it against a nuclear arm, a nuclear arm by then probably North Korea. Uh, and they feel it has to take measures in developing its own military capabilities that are not in China's interest and not in the interest of stability around the region. Third possibility is that there is a, a period of conflict, not a huge war, but a period of tension, and everyone is diverted. And North Korea takes that as, sees that as an opportunity uh, to really cause trouble uh, militarily. And uh, so, no matter how you look at it, it's lose, lose, lose. And uh, that's you know, it's a, it's a huge problem. That's why I think that there are issues out there that uh, you have to really work very hard to prevent uh, the kind of accident or incident uh, that really tests the limits of engagement. And, uh, and even, no matter who wins, everyone loses. But other than that, I want to thank you, and thank you all for coming today.